want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sorry, Goose, but it's time to buzz the tower. In 1986, Top Gun redefined the Hollywood blockbuster, prompted a massive increase in U.S. Navy enlistment, helped turn Jerry Bruckheimer into a mega producer, and launched actor Tom Cruise into the A-list stratosphere. Considering the movie's pop culture impact and lasting legacy, it's hard to believe Top Gun had major difficulties getting off the ground. And find out what the fuck happened to this movie. Top Gun started life as a California Magazine article about a San Diego school for elite Navy fighter pilots. When producer Jerry Bruckheimer saw the piece and its thrilling images, he described it as Star Wars on Earth, and he set about acquiring the rights to make a movie based on the article. Right away, Bruckheimer and producing partner Don Simpson hit some turbulence. Aviation movies had gone out of style, and the 1984 Air Force TV series Call to Glory had just crashed and burned. The general perception in Hollywood at the time was that audiences just weren't very interested in watching planes and their pilots. Undeterred, the duo pitched the concept to Jeffrey Katzenberg at Paramount Pictures, and he was hesitantly receptive to the idea. Katzenberg recruited screenwriting team Jack Epps Jr. and Jim Cash, who had been toiling on Dick Tracy during its time in development hell, and gave them the challenge of turning the relatively brief Top Gun article into a feature-length film about hotshot military pilots. But Epps and Cash immediately realized that a movie just wouldn't even be possible unless they had access to actual F-14 Tomcat jets, and that would require the cooperation of the U.S. Navy. Before a single page of script was written, Simpson and Bruckheimer headed to the Pentagon to meet with high-ranking members of the Navy and pitch the broad strokes of their fictionalized version of Top Gun. Though the idea was initially met with skepticism, Secretary of the Navy John Lehman thought that a well-made movie about fighter pilots could be a victory for the military, and provisionally agreed to collaborate. Thanks for watching Joe Blow Videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show! Retired ace pilot Pete Viper Pettigrew was assigned as the movie's technical advisor and would act as liaison between the studio and the Navy. At this point, Epps and Cash had no idea what the movie's story would even be. Pettigrew's involvement was critical. His record and reputation opened doors and convinced otherwise reluctant pilots and instructors to share their stories. Jack Epps joined Pettigrew at the Real Top Gun Fighter School in Miramar, California, and performed numerous interviews with various personnel, gaining insight into not just military careers and tactics, but also personal lives and losses. Bits and pieces of these stories were effectively Frankensteined together into a script for Top Gun. But it was climbing into the backseat of a combat jet that was the creative epiphany for Epps, who was a private pilot himself, but had never been in a supersonic fighter plane. The exhilarating but exhausting experience of pulling G's and blasting through the sky at a thousand miles an hour made the writer realize these pilots were really athletes competing at the highest level. He and Cash decided to frame Top Gun like a sports movie, complete with locker room rivalries and a championship prize. After weeks of writing and consulting with Pettigrew, Epps and Cash turned in their first draft of Top Gun. Don Simpson flipped out for it, calling it one of the best screenplays he had ever read. But Pettigrew had some bad news. The Navy was never going to approve it, and major changes would be necessary. The Navy wasn't the only obstacle on the runway. Paramount executives, including then-president Michael Eisner, weren't exactly fans of the script. Even after several rewrites, and Simpson supposedly getting on his knees and begging Eisner to make the movie, the project ultimately stalled. But as Top Gun sat in storage, Eisner departed Paramount to become chairman of Disney, and took Jeffrey Katzenberg with him. Incoming Paramount head Ned Tannen needed new material for the studio, and soon after hearing the pitch for Top Gun, he gave the producers approval to make the movie with a budget of $14 million. For the lead role of cocky pilot Pete Maverick Mitchell, the writers had only ever thought of Tom Cruise, after seeing the actor in All the Right Moves. Bruckheimer and Simpson also anticipated Cruise was the next big star, and by that point they could not envision anyone else in the part. The only problem was, the actor was not particularly interested. Cruz had just finished shooting Ridley Scott's ambitious fantasy, Legend. He had recently ended a relationship with Risky Business co-star Rebecca De Mornay, and he was busy traveling the country and wasn't keen on committing to any major new projects. But Bruckheimer knew that Cruz was an adrenaline junkie. Even back then, he felt the need for speed. The producer thought Cruz might be convinced to star in the movie if he could just get the actor into a fighter jet, and arranged for him to fly with the Blue Angels in California. 
Sure enough, zipping through the skies and hitting 4G turns was exactly the kind of persuasion that Cruz needed. There was a catch, of course. Cruz's agent wanted $1 million for his participation, which at the time was a cool chunk of change for a young actor with a single big success to his name. The producers flinched at the price tag and called the casting director asking for alternatives. But when she honestly couldn't think of anyone better suited for the part, Cruz got his first of many substantial paychecks. To direct the movie, Simpson and Bruckheimer went to Tony Scott, brother of Ridley. Scott was considered an unusual choice as his only other feature, the 1983 David Bowie horror thriller The Hunger, had not exactly been well received, although the producers appreciated its atmosphere. But it was Scott's stylish advertising work that had really caught their eye, particularly a Saab commercial featuring a car racing a fighter jet. The director initially envisioned Top Gun to be something darker, like Apocalypse Now on an aircraft carrier, but he soon saw the potential of a popcorn movie about the rock stars of the skies. When it came time for casting, Scott was inspired by a Bruce Weber photo book of male models for the look of the characters. The project unsurprisingly became a hot Hollywood property for young up-and-coming actors. Val Kilmer was initially not interested, but was convinced by Scott to play Iceman, the meticulous contrast to Cruz's impulsive Maverick. Revenge of the Nerds co-star Anthony Edwards landed the role of Maverick's lovable radar officer, Goose. Other flight suits would be filled by Barry Tubb, Whip Hubley, Rick Rosevich, and Tim Robbins, with naval authority figures played by Michael Ironside, James Tolkien, and Tom Skerritt. For the movie's love interest, Charlie Blackwood, many actresses were considered, including Linda Fiorentino, Ali Sheedy, and Meg Ryan, who would instead get the smaller role of Goose's charming wife. The part of Charlie went to theater actor Kelly McGillis, who had made an impression with her recent work in the Harrison Ford thriller Witness. Scott felt she had the emotional maturity to believably match wits with the charismatic but egotistical pilots of Top Gun. But while the casting process had been relatively painless, the production itself would be a constant dogfight between the filmmakers and the Navy, who were extremely protective of the real Top Gun program and how it would be presented to mass audiences. Early drafts of the script had Charlie as an enlisted officer, but the Navy rejected this forbidden fraternization. The character was then changed to a civilian contractor, who ended up being based on an actual civilian specialist the filmmakers had met at Miramar. Another point of contention was the fate of Goose, who was originally going to perish in a mid-air collision, one of several accidents the movie planned to include. But the Navy would approve only one flight mishap, and it had to be a single plane. This led to the scene of Maverick going into a flat spin after traveling through another plane's jet wash, and Goose fatally ejecting into the canopy, all of which was based on real aerodynamics and a true story Pettigrew had shared. Another moment of unreality that incensed the Navy was the briefing scene, from Charlie's seamed stockings to Wolfman's taboo cowboy hat to the meeting taking place in a wide open hangar rather than a more practical lecture room. When the actual Top Gun instructors on set that day expressed their concerns to Pete Pettigrew, he shrugged and said, at this point I'm just trying to stop them from turning it into a musical. There were some other concessions like the locker room scene. Pettigrew understood the film's sports analogy and the idea of a place where conversations could happen outside of rank and uniform, and also the potential appeal of shirtless hunks to certain audience demographics. Similarly, there was initial resistance to the movie's fictional Top Gun trophy, which represented a physical goal for the competition at the Fighter Weapons School. As screenwriter Jack Epps put it, never let the truth get in the way of a good movie. As for buzzing the tower, this was absolutely prohibited under any circumstances. But one lucky Navy pilot got the opportunity to live out the fantasies of his Top Gun peers with a low-altitude flyby just for the movie. Before filming even started, Bruckheimer had sent the script to Axel F. composer Harold Faltermeyer, asking him for an anthem, which he put together without seeing a frame of footage. Scott would play Faltermeyer's theme song on the set to establish tone and pump up the cast. To prepare for the shoot, the actors went through a four-day pilot survival training course at Miramar. The production itself was broken into three stages, starting with all the dramatic scenes on the ground, filmed in and around San Diego. Cruz, who was feeling the pressure of headlining a major studio movie, took a method approach and stayed separate from the other actors, particularly his on-screen rival Val Kilmer, who often partied with his fellow film pilots. During this early phase, Tony Scott was constantly under threat of dismissal by the studio for his vision from McGillis's wardrobe and glamorous makeup to the excessive time spent filming the now iconic volleyball scene, which the director once jokingly called soft porn. Scott later commented that he basically got fired from the movie several times, but just kept filming anyway. 
McGillis herself was also nearly on the chopping block when studio executives saw dailies and weren't convinced of her chemistry with Cruz. Editor Billy Weber quickly assembled the dinner scene to help the producers assure the studio of her appeal, rather than recast and reshoot all her completed footage. From there, the production headed to the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, which presented other difficulties. In addition to being an incredibly noisy environment for the director to communicate with his cast and crew, the carrier was engaged in actual operations at the time, and the production was essentially just along for the ride to capture whatever footage they could. At one point, Scott was shooting a critical scene at magic hour when the captain began turning the ship, losing the director's perfect natural lighting. Scott asked how much it would cost to change course, and wrote a personal check for $25,000 to get the captain to turn around for a few minutes so Scott could get his shot. Val Kilmer also took some convincing over a line of dialogue that he felt was too hokey to say in front of actual Navy personnel on the deck of the carrier, but Scott eventually talked him into it. You can be my wingman anytime. And the Navy wasn't entirely tolerant of the Hollywood flyboys. Rick Rosevich was actually escorted off the vessel before filming was complete after making wisecracks to officers. The final stage of production was capturing the intense aerial scenes. Various scale models were used for the crashes and explosions, but the biggest production challenge was shooting high-velocity flying footage in ways that had never been done before. Scott scrawled hand-drawn storyboards and worked with top Navy aerial coordinators to develop the flying scenes, which were shot in Nevada using real Navy pilots, and continually evolved based on the limitations of actual physics, often to Scott's frustration. Air footage was filmed with a camera-equipped Learjet and an F-14 mounted with external cameras, while lower altitude scenes were shot using a camera rig placed on a mountaintop as the jets blasted by at supersonic speed. Once the planned scenes were shot, Scott asked the pilots to perform any other maneuvers they thought might be visually impressive. This impromptu session led to the Pitch Pulse, an instantaneous 6G pull-up that wowed Scott so much it became Maverick's signature move. One thing that did not go to plan was capturing airborne footage of the actual actors in the rear of the cockpit, showing their faces and delivering dialogue. Kilmer had declined to go up in a jet, but of the actors that did take to the skies, everyone except Anthony Edwards ejected their lunch. Barry Tubb joked that he vomited so much his own toenails came up. Needless to say, all the in-air footage of the actors was unusable. Scott ended up filming all the cockpit scenes in a simulator gimbal on a soundstage, using real aerial footage playing on a screen behind the actors. As potentially dangerous as the real-life jet maneuvers might have been, it was capturing that projection footage that led to a tragic accident. Professional aerobatic pilot Art Scholl was filming background plates for the flat spin sequence when he experienced mechanical failure and was lost in a crash. The film was dedicated to him. Once principal photography wrapped in autumn 1985, Scott and editors Chris LeBenzon and Billy Weber started stitching together the movie. The screening of their first cut was a disaster. The flying sequences were incomprehensible, and the movie did not work without them. Harold Faltermeyer was so confounded he tried to get out of working on the film. Tony Scott was, yet again, in danger of getting fired. But Simpson and Bruckheimer remained optimistic. They sat down with Scott and the editors and reassembled the movie frame by frame. Scott's storyboard sketches and vision for the flying scenes had proven useless relative to the footage he had captured, and the sequences were effectively built from scratch in the editing room, using input from real Top Gun pilots. Shooting new aerial footage was unthinkable, and in the days before convincing CGI, the only option was to scour the existing film for any suitable moments. Editor Billy Weber said that out of several hundred thousand feet of flight and cockpit footage, every usable frame was in the final movie. Luckily, the actors' mouths were usually covered by oxygen masks, since new dialogue needed to be written and recorded to conform to the manufactured scenes. Simpson and Bruckheimer's previous box office blockbusters, Flashdance and Beverly Hills Cop, had multi-platinum selling soundtracks, and that expectation was the same for Top Gun. A cut of the movie was screened to a cattle call group of musicians and pop acts to solicit song contributions, resulting in more than a hundred submissions for the filmmakers to sort through and select their favorites. Kenny Loggins' song, Playing With The Boys, was used for the infamous volleyball scene, and he was also a last-minute replacement for the band Toto on Danger Zone, which ended up being one of Loggins' biggest hits. While the movie had been shaped into satisfactory form, Paramount still wanted feedback from an actual outside audience and selected Dallas for a screening. Just days before it was scheduled, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded after takeoff, killing the seven crew members aboard. As the nation mourned the tragedy, the screening went ahead as planned. 
Dreading a subdued response from the moviegoers, the producers were instead pleasantly surprised by an overwhelmingly positive reaction, and they knew they had a hit on their hands. Exhibitor screenings followed, and the feedback was that the movie was exciting, but the romance needed to be stronger. The filmmakers quickly convened to add a couple more scenes. Unfortunately, McGillis's hair had been cut short and returned to her natural color, while Cruz was busy filming Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money with a new, higher hairstyle, and he was only available for one day. To circumvent these issues, they put McGillis in a hat and soaked down Cruz's hair for the elevator seduction, and then filmed a quick love scene in shadow. The additional PG-rated passion was swiftly edited into the movie just before the final mix was finished and theatrical prints were cut. In May 1986, Top Gun premiered in New York and San Diego, where the cast and crew were in attendance, along with Navy pilots and top brass, who were not nearly as impressed as the filmmakers and studio. Also vocal in their disappointment were the critics. Although the flying scenes earned praise, Top Gun received brutal reviews that called it clunky, predictable, corny, and jingoistic propaganda. But general audiences didn't care in the slightest. The movie opened in first place at the box office and rapidly became a cultural phenomenon. Sales of bomber jackets and aviator sunglasses skyrocketed. Navy recruitment soared, and thanks to the increased spotlight, the actual Top Gun school was rewarded with new planes and headquarters. Tunes from the soundtrack were omnipresent, and Berlin's ballad, Take My Breath Away, reached number one on the Billboard charts and won an Oscar for Best Original Song, while Goose and Maverick's awkward barroom rendition prompted a radio resurgence of the Righteous Brothers' You've Lost That Love and Feeling. The Top Gun soundtrack ultimately sold over 11 million copies. Top Gun remained in theaters for 10 months, eventually collecting $175 million domestic and over $350 million worldwide, and its home video release was one of the first VHS movies sold at an affordable retail price, eventually moving almost 3 million copies. The movie cemented Tom Cruise's status as an international superstar, and he is now forever associated with the brash character of Maverick. Several other cast members were also launched to stardom, Jerry Bruckheimer, along with Don Simpson until his death in 1996, produced a string of box office smashes and reunited with Tony Scott on five more productions. The director sadly took his own life in 2012. Top Gun's energetic style and unapologetic mix of music, militarism, and machismo influenced countless movies and filmmakers. And of course, it's also prompted some interesting discussions and interpretations. It is a story about a man's struggle with his own homosexuality. While the movie does remain distinctly 80s, after more than three and a half decades, its propulsive aerial sequences are still considered some of the most remarkable ever put on film. And while a sequel had been discussed ever since the first movie's success, Tom Cruise is finally climbing back into the cockpit and hitting the afterburners again for Top Gun Maverick, because audiences still feel that need. The need for speed. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments. And thanks for watching.